Here's a collection of seven of the top creepypastas I've narrated over the past year. If you want to see new content from me, make sure to subscribe. I upload new videos every week. I'll be leaving the time codes for each story in a pinned comment in case you want to jump around between them. But with that being said, let's get into the first story. Enjoy. Laughing Jack. It was a nice summer day. My five-year-old son James was playing outside in the backyard of our suburban home. James has always been a quiet boy. He plays by himself, mostly. He never had many friends. But he always had a wild imagination. I was in the kitchen feeding our dog Fido when I heard what sounded like James talking to someone in the backyard. I'm not sure who it was he could be talking to. Could he have finally made a friend? Being a single mum, it's hard for me to always keep an eye on my son. So I decided to go outside and check on him. When I went into the backyard, I was a bit confused because James was the only person back there. Was he talking to himself? I could have sworn I heard another voice. James, it's time to come inside, I called out to him. He came inside and sat down at the kitchen table. It was about lunchtime, so I decided to make him a turkey sandwich. James, who were you talking to out there? I asked. James looked up for a moment. I was playing with my new friend, he said, smiling. I poured him some milk and continued to pry, as any good mother would. Does your friend have a name? Why didn't you ask him to have lunch with us? I asked. James stared at me for a moment before replying. His name is Laughing Jack. I was a bit taken aback by what he had said. Oh, that's a strange name. What does your friend look like? I asked, a bit confused. He's a clown. He has long hair and a big swirly cone nose. He's got long arms and baggy pants with stripy socks. And he's always smiling. I realised my son was talking about an imaginary friend. I suppose it is normal for kids his age to have imaginary friends, especially when he has no real kids to play with. It's probably just a phase. The rest of the day went by as per usual, and it was starting to get late, so I put James to bed. I tucked him in, gave him a kiss, and made sure to turn on his nightlight before I closed the door. I was pretty tired myself, so I decided to go to bed. Not long after, I had an awful nightmare. It was dark. I was in some kind of rundown amusement park. I was scared, running through an endless field of empty tents, broken down rides, and abandoned game huts. The whole place had a horrible look to it. Everything was black and white. The prize stuffed animals all hung from nooses in the game huts, all with sick grins stitched on their faces. It felt like the whole park was looking at me, even though there wasn't another living thing in sight. Then suddenly, I began to hear music play. The sounds of Pop Goes the Weasel being played on a squeezy box echoed through the park. It was hypnotising. I followed its tune to the circus tent, almost in a trance unable to stop my legs from moving forward. It was pitch black. 
The only light came from a single spotlight shining on the centre of the big top. As I walked towards the light, the music slowed down. I found myself singing along, unable to stop. All around the mulberry bush, the monkey chased the weasel. The monkey thought it was all in fun. The music stopped right before its climax, and suddenly the lights shot on. The intensity of the lights was practically blinding. All I could see was a small dark silhouette shuffle towards me. Then another one appeared, and another, and another. There were dozens of them, all coming towards me. I couldn't move. My legs were frozen. All I could do was watch as the haunting figures drew nearer. As they got close, I could see. They were children. As I looked at each one, I noticed they were all horribly disfigured and mutilated. Some had cuts all over their body, others were severely burnt, and others were missing limbs, even eyes. The children enveloped me, clawing at my flesh, dragging me to the ground and tearing inside of me. As the children tore me apart and I faded away, all I could hear was laughter, horrible. Evil laughter. <laughs> I woke up the next morning in a cold sweat. After taking a few deep breaths, I looked over and saw that a few of James's action figures were positioned facing me on top of my nightstand. I sighed. James had probably woken up early and put these there. I gathered up the toys and made my way to James's room. However, when I opened the door, James was sound asleep. I just shrugged and placed the toys back into the toy box and headed out to the living room. A little while later, James woke up and I made him his breakfast. He was quiet and seemed a bit groggy. Perhaps he didn't sleep well either. I decided to ask him about the toys. James, honey, did you put the toys in Mummy's room this morning? His eyes shot up at me for a moment, then quickly glanced back down at his cereal. Laughing Jack did it. I rolled my eyes and responded. Well, you tell Laughing Jack to keep the toys in your room. James nodded and finished up his breakfast, then decided to go play in the backyard. I went to relax in the living room, and I must have dozed off, because I woke up a couple hours later. Shit, I need to go check on James. I was a bit worried. It had been over two hours, and I hadn't checked on him. I went stepping out into the backyard, but James wasn't there anymore. I was getting nervous, so I called out to him. James! James, where are you? Just then, I heard a giggle come from the front yard. I rushed through the gate, around to the front of the house. James was sitting on the sidewalk. I breathed a sigh of relief, and walked over to him. James, how many times have I told you to stay in the backyard? James, what are you eating? James looked up at me, then reached into his pocket, and pulled out a handful of hard candies in all colours. This made me very nervous. James, who gave you that candy? James just stared at me, not speaking. James, please tell mummy where you got that candy. 
James hung his head down and said, Laughing Jack gave it to me. My heart sank. I knelt down to look at him in the eye. James, I've had enough of this damn Laughing Jack. He is not real. Now this is a very serious situation, and I need to know who gave you the candy. I could see my son's eyes tearing up. But Mama, Laughing Jack did give me the candy. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath. James has never lied to me, but what he was telling me is impossible. I made him spit out the candy and throw the rest away. James appears to be fine. Maybe I'm just overreacting, after all. He could have gotten it from Tom and Linda from next door, or Mr. Walker down the street. Either way, I'm going to have to keep a closer eye on James. That night, I put James to bed, as usual, and decided to go to bed early myself. Suddenly, I was woken up by a loud bang coming from the kitchen. I sprung out of bed and hurried down the stairs. When I got to the kitchen, I was horrified. Everything on the counters had been thrown on the floor, and our dog Fido hung dead from the light fixture. His stomach was cut open and stuffed with candy, the same type that James was eating earlier that day. My shock was quickly broken by a sharp scream coming from James's room, followed by loud crashes. I quickly grabbed a knife from the drawer and moved up the stairs with the speed that only a mother whose child is in danger could have. I burst through the door and flicked on the lights. Everything in the room was knocked over and tossed on the floor. My poor son, in his bed crying and shaking with fear, a pool of urine staining the sheets. I scooped my child up and ran out of the house and went next door to Tom and Linda's house. Luckily, they were still awake. They let me use their phone and I called the police. It didn't take them long to arrive and I explained what had happened. They looked at me as if I were crazy. They searched the house, but all they found was a dead dog and two trashed rooms. The officer told me that someone had probably gotten into the house and done this right before making a quick escape when they heard me coming up the stairs. I knew it wasn't true. All the doors were locked, and none of the windows were open. Whatever was in my house didn't come from outside. The next day, James stayed inside. I didn't want him to leave my sight. I went into the garage and found his old baby monitor and set it up in his room. If anything comes into his room tonight, I was going to be able to hear it. I went into the kitchen and grabbed the largest knife from the drawer and put it on my nightstand. Imaginary friend or not, I'm not letting anything hurt my little boy. Soon enough, night came. I put James to bed. He was afraid but I promised him that I wasn't going to let anything happen to him. I tucked him in, gave him a kiss, and turned on the night light. Before closing the door, I whispered to him, Good night, James. I love you. I tried to stay up as long as I could. But after a few hours, I felt myself drifting off. My baby would be safe for the night, and I needed sleep. 
just as I lay my head on the pillow, I heard a soft noise coming from the baby monitor I had put on my nightstand. At first, it sounded like interference, like the kind a radio would make. Then it turned into a soft moan. Was James asleep? Then I heard it. The laugh from my nightmare. That horrible laugh. I sprung up from bed and grabbed the knife from under my pillow. I rushed over to James's room and creaked the door open. I tried the light switch, but it wouldn't come on. I took a step in, and I could feel a warm, thick liquid on my feet. Suddenly, James's nightlight came on, and I could see the absolute horror laid out in front of me. James's body was nailed up on the wall, the nails piercing through his hands and feet. His chest was cut wide open, and his organs hung down to the floor. His eyes and tongue had been removed, along with most of his teeth. I was disgusted. I could hardly believe this was my baby boy. Then I heard it again. The soft, desperate moan. James was still alive. My baby, my poor baby, in so much pain barely clinging to life. I ran across the room and vomited on the floor, but my sickness was interrupted by a horrible cackle <laughs> coming from behind me. I spun around while still wiping the bile from my mouth. Then out of the shadows emerged the fiend responsible for all this horror. Laughing Jack. His ghost white skin and matted black hair hung down to his shoulders. He had piercing white eyes surrounded by dark black rings. His twisted smile revealed a row of sharp, jagged teeth. And his skin didn't look like skin at all. It almost looked like rubber or plastic. He wore a patchy black and white clown outfit, with striped sleeves and socks. His body itself was grotesque, his long arms hanging down past his waist, and the way he was poised made him look almost boneless, like a rag doll. He let out a <laughs> sickening laugh, as if to let me know he was pleased by my reaction to his work. He then turned around slowly in front of James, and began to laugh even more at the horrific sight he has laid out. That was enough to shake me from my terror. I snapped. Get away from him, you bastard! I rushed at the monster, raising the knife above my head, and stabbed it down at him. But as soon as the knife touched him, he disappeared in a cloud of black smoke. The knife passed right through, and pierced James's still beating heart, splashing warm blood onto my face. No, what have I done? My baby! I killed my baby! I immediately fell to my knees, and I could hear the sirens in the distance growing louder. My boy, my sweet baby boy, I promised mummy would protect you, but I failed. I'm sorry, James. I'm so sorry. Police soon arrived to find me in front of my son, still wielding the knife covered in my baby's blood. The trial was short. Insanity. I was placed in the Feropolis house for the criminally insane, 
where I have been for the past two months. It's not so bad here. The only reason I'm awake right now is because someone is playing Pop Goes the Weasel outside my window. I'll talk to the orderlies about it in the morning. The Russian Sleep Experiment Russian researchers in the late 1940s kept five people awake for 15 days using an experimental gas-based stimulant. They were kept in a sealed environment to carefully monitor their oxygen intake so the gas didn't kill them since it was toxic in high concentrations. This was before closed-circuit cameras, so they had only microphones and 5-inch thick glass porthole-sized windows into the chamber to monitor them. The chamber was stocked with books, cots to sleep on, but no bedding, running water and a toilet and enough dried food to last all five for over a month. The test subjects were political prisoners deemed enemies of the state during World War II. Everything was fine for the first five days. The subjects hardly complained, having been promised, falsely, that they would be freed if they submitted to the test and did not sleep for 30 days. Their conversations and activities were monitored, and it was noted that they continued to talk about increasingly traumatic incidents in their past, and the general tone of their conversations took on a darker aspect after the four-day mark. After five days, they started to complain about the circumstances and events that led them to where they were, and started to demonstrate severe paranoia. They stopped talking to each other, and began alternately whispering to the microphones and to the one-way mirrored portholes. Oddly, they all seemed to think that they could win over the trust of the experimenters by turning over their comrades, the other subjects in captivity with them. At first, the researchers suspected this was an effect of the gas itself. After nine days, the first of them started screaming. He ran the length of the chamber repeatedly, yelling at the top of his lungs for three hours straight. He continued attempting to scream, but was only able to produce occasional squeaks. The researchers postulated that he had physically torn his vocal cords. The most surprising thing about this behaviour is how the other captives reacted to it or rather, didn't react at all. They continued whispering to the microphones until the second of the captives started to scream. Two of the non-screaming captives took the books apart, smearing page after page with their own feces and pasted them calmly over the glass portholes. The screaming promptly stopped. So did the whispering to the microphones. After three more days passed, the researchers checked the microphones hourly to make sure they were working, since they thought it impossible that no sounds could be coming with five people inside. The oxygen consumption in the chamber indicated that all five must still be alive. In fact, it was the amount of oxygen five people would consume at a very high level of strenuous exercise. On the morning of the 14th day, the researchers did something they said they would not do 
to get a reaction from the captives. They used the intercom inside the chamber, hoping to provoke any response from the captives they were afraid were either dead or vegetables. They announced, We are opening the chamber to test the microphones. Step away from the door and lie flat on the floor, or you will be shot. Compliance will earn one of you your immediate freedom. To their surprise, they heard a single phrase in a calm voice respond. We no longer want to be freed. Debate broke out among the researchers and the military forces funding the research. Unable to provoke any more response using the intercom, it was finally decided to open the chamber at midnight on the 15th day. The chamber was flushed of the stimulant gas and filled with fresh air, and immediately voices from the microphones began to object. Three different voices began begging, as if pleading for the life of loved ones to turn the gas back on. The chamber was opened, and soldiers sent in to retrieve the test subjects. They began to scream louder than ever, and so did the soldiers when they saw what was inside. Four of the five subjects were still alive, although no one could rightfully call the state that any of them in life. The food rations past day five had not been so much as touched. There were chunks of meat from the dead test subjects' thighs and chest stuffed into the drain in the centre of the chamber, blocking the drain and allowing four inches of water to accumulate on the floor. Precisely how much of the liquid on the floor was actually blood was never determined. All four of the surviving test subjects also had large portions of muscle and skin torn away from their bodies. The destruction of flesh and exposed bone on their fingertips indicated that the wounds were inflicted by hand, not by teeth, as the researchers initially thought. Closer examination of the position and angles of the wounds indicated that most if not all of them, were self-inflicted. The abdominal organs below the ribcage of all four test subjects had been removed, while the heart, lungs and diaphragm remained in place. The skin and most of the muscles attached to the ribs had been ripped off, exposing the lungs through the ribcage. All the blood vessels and organs remained intact. They had been taken out and laid on the floor, fanning out around the eviscerated but still living bodies of the subjects. The digestive tract of all four had been seen to be working, digesting food. It quickly became apparent that what they were digesting was their own flesh that they had ripped off and eaten over the course of days. Most of the soldiers were Russian special operatives at the facility, but still, many refused to return to the chamber to remove the test subjects. They continued to scream to be left in the chamber, and alternately begged and demanded that the gas be turned back on, lest they fall asleep. To everyone's surprise, the test subjects put up a fierce fight in the process of being removed from the chamber. One of the Russian soldiers died from having his throat ripped out. Another was gravely injured by having his testicles ripped off 
and an artery in his leg severed by one of the subject's teeth. Another five of the soldiers lost their lives, if you count the ones that committed suicide in the weeks following the incident. In the struggle, one of the four living subjects had his spleen ruptured and he bled out almost immediately. The medical researchers attempted to sedate him, but this proved impossible. He was injected with more than ten times the human dose of morphine derivative, and still fought like a cornered animal, breaking the ribs and arm of one doctor. His heart was seen to beat for a full two minutes after he had bled out, to the point that there was more air in his vascular system than blood. Even after it stopped, he continued to scream and flail for another three minutes, struggling to attack anyone in reach and just repeating the word, more, over and over, weaker and weaker, until he finally fell silent. The surviving three test subjects were heavily restrained and moved to a medical facility. The two with intact vocal cords continuously begged for the gas, demanding to be kept awake. The most injured of the three was taken to the only surgical operative room that the facility had. In the process of preparing the subject to have his organs placed back within his body, it was found that he was effectively immune to the sedative they had given him to prepare him for the surgery. He fought viciously against his restraints when the anaesthetic gas was brought out to put him under. He managed to tear most of the way through a four-inch wide leather strap on one wrist, even through the weight of a 200-pound soldier holding that wrist as well. It took only a little more anaesthetic than normal to put him under, and the instant his eyelids fluttered and closed, his heart stopped. In the autopsy of the test subject that died on the operating table, it was found that his blood had triple the normal level of oxygen. His muscles that were still attached to his skeleton were badly torn, and he had broken nine bones in his struggle to not be subdued. Most of them were from the force his own muscles had exerted on them. The second survivor had been the first of the group of five to start screaming. His vocal cords destroyed. He was unable to beg or object to surgery, and he only reacted by shaking his head violently in disapproval when the anaesthetic gas was brought near him. He shook his head, yes, when someone suggested, reluctantly, that they try the surgery without anaesthetic, and did not react for the entire six-hour process of replacing his abdominal organs and attempting to cover them with what remained of his skin. The surgeon presiding stated repeatedly that it should be medically impossible for the patient to still be alive. One terrified nurse assisting the surgery stated that she had seen the patient's mouth curl into a smile several times whenever his eyes met hers. When the surgery ended, the subject looked at the surgeon and began to wheeze loudly, attempting to talk while struggling. Assuming this must be something of drastic importance, the surgeon had a pen and pad fetched so the patient could write his message. It was simple. Keep cutting.
The other two test subjects were given the same surgery, both without anaesthetic as well. Although they had to be injected with a paralytic for the duration of the operation, the surgeon found it impossible to perform the operation while the patients laughed continuously. Once paralysed, the subjects could only follow the attending researchers with their eyes. The paralytic cleared their system in an abnormally short period of time, and they were soon trying to escape their bonds. The moment they could speak, they were again asking for the stimulant gas. The researchers tried asking why they had injured themselves, why they had ripped out their own guts, and why they wanted to be given the gas again. Only one response was given. I must remain awake. All three subjects' restraints were reinforced, and they were placed back into the chamber, awaiting determination as to what should be done with them. The researchers facing the wrath of their military benefactors for having failed the stated goals of their project considered euthanizing the surviving subjects. The commanding officer, an ex-KGB, instead saw potential and wanted to see what would happen if they were put back on the gas. The researchers strongly objected but were overruled. In preparation for being sealed in the chamber again, the subjects were connected to an EEG monitor and had their restraints padded for long-term confinement. To everyone's surprise, all three stopped struggling at the moment they let slip that they were going back on the gas. It was obvious at this point all three were putting up a great struggle to stay awake. One of the subjects that could speak was humming loudly and continuously. The mute subject was straining his legs against the leather bonds with all his might. First left, then right, then left again for something to focus on. The remaining subject was holding his head off his pillow and blinking rapidly. Having been the first to be wired for the EEG, most of the researchers were monitoring his brainwaves in surprise. They were normal most of the time, but sometimes flatlined inexplicably. It looked as if he were repeatedly suffering brain death before returning to normal. As they focused on the paper scrolling out of the brainwave monitor, only one nurse saw his eyes slip shut at the same moment his head hit the pillow. His brainwaves immediately changed to that of a deep sleep, then flatlined for the last time as his heart simultaneously stopped. The only remaining subject that could speak started screaming to be sealed in now. His brain waves showed the same flat lines as the one who had just died from falling asleep. The commander gave the order to seal the chamber with both subjects inside, as well as three researchers. One of the named immediately drew his gun and shot the commander point-blank between the eyes, then turned the gun on the mute subject and blew his brains out as well. He pointed his gun at the remaining subject, still restrained to a bed, as the remaining members of the medical and research team fled the room. I won't be locked in here with these things. Not with you, he screamed at the man strapped to the table. What are you? he demanded. I must know. 
the subject smiled. Have you forgotten so easily? We are you. We are the madness that lurks within you all, begging to be free every moment in your deepest animal mind. We are what you hide from in your beds every night. We are what you sedate into silence and paralysis when you go to the nocturnal haven where we cannot tread. The researcher paused, then aimed at the subject's head, and fired. The EEG flatlined as the subject weakly choked out. So nearly... Will you play with me? I never wanted to reveal my story, but it has to be done. It's been so long, and nobody's known. But now, I confide in you, the listener, to hear my story and attempt to comprehend the horrors I experienced. My voice may stutter or shake from time to time as I try to tell you my story, but I warn you now, what you are about to hear cannot be unheard. It was an ordinary night in my apartment. I was so tired. The days at the office had been so stressful lately and I looked forward to the quiet release of sleep. It always seemed to make everything better. But this night was different. The wind seemed ominous. The sky seemed darker. And as I relaxed in my chair, watching my favourite sitcoms before bed, I saw what appeared as a strange silhouette standing outside my window. I focused my full sight on what I thought was there. Nothing. Just darkness. I figured I was just overtired. Just a little too much work today. That's all. I finished watching my show and retired to my bed. As I tried my best to fall asleep, I heard the door at the end of my bedroom creak. I dismissed it too tired to get myself worked up over nothing. I then got the sense something was watching me. I tried to shake it off. I just wanted to sleep. Finally, I heard something breathing heavily and slowly. At first, I thought it was me and that I was psyching myself out. So I held my breath for a moment. It wasn't me. I jolted upward from my bed and opened my eyes. I became frozen as I saw, at the foot of my bed, a young girl with long black hair, around the age of six, in a white nightgown. She stared at me with unblinking eyes and a wide smile. She had deep cuts covering her face, and her hands that hung at her side were covered in crimson. We both sat and stood staring at one another for a good moment, until she let out a horrifying inhuman scream. At that moment I tried to race for the door, but she leapt on me, digging her nails into my face, her dark black eyes inches away from mine, screaming all the way. The screaming became deafening, and soon I lost my balance and hit my head on the table next to my bed. I lost consciousness, my vision fading to black. I awoke in what appeared to be an empty basement. My clothes remained on, except for my shirt. I struggled to find my balance. My head was covered in dry blood. I looked at my arms. They were covered in cuts, some of them forming words. I found etched into my arms 
the words, Will you play with me? It was also written on both of my sides. I gazed around the room in horror and found an iron door with blood seeping at the base. I slowly made my way there. There was no sign of the girl, though I feared she may be behind the door. Despite my fear, I had to go in. I had to. What I saw was horrifying. Bodies lay spread across the wide room, all the way to the stairwell on the opposite corner. Men, women, children. All of them lay still. Cuts on their arms and legs, similar to mine, read, Will you play with me? Except these victims had something I didn't have. I looked at a nearby woman in horror. She laid on her back, her stomach split open. As I came closer, what came into my sight was a large toy fire truck, shoved in with her entrails. I choked back vomit and backed away. A man laying against the wall had metal jacks stuck into both of his eyes. His skull had caved in, and what lay next to him was a broken baseball bat snapped in half in a pool of blood. A young boy lay lifeless in the very middle. His mouth was wide open, and sticking out of it was the beginning of a toy car track. It had been shoved down his throat. His chest was cut open, and his heart lay next to his body. In place of his heart were the dismantled pieces of a doll. I lost control and vomited. I cried for a moment, but then the thought struck me. Where's the girl? I didn't think this, wanting to know where she was, of course. I thought it very briefly before noticing the stairwell that stood at the corner of the room. I started walking towards it, but then I stopped. Something behind me was breathing heavily. I turned around, and there stood the girl. After having stood in the corner in wait this entire time as I was examining the bodies, she then said in a high voice that pierced my ears with terror, Will you play with me? She began screaming, I turned to run away, but she was on me, knife-sharp nails driving into my back and neck. I struggled and eventually threw her off me and onto the ground. I ran for the door, but it slammed shut. I banged on it and cursed, blood running down my back. It would not open. She was on me again. I elbowed her face. She drove her nails into my back. I managed to push her off of me and turn around. As she lunged, I caught her. Her big black eyes inches away from mine. Her nails plunged into my face. Her screams deafening my ears. She raised one hand, smiling ear to ear. And her hand plunged down onto my eyes. Pulsing spots of red clouded my vision before everything went black. I awoke to the beeping of hospital machines. Bandages covered my body, including both of my eyes. A police officer stood in the room, speaking with a doctor. They saw that I was awake and smiled. They informed me I was the only survivor of a mass murder, and that the suspect, a middle-aged man, had been captured. I told them about the girl. They said no girl was found at the scene. They didn't believe me. They told me I should rest. Two weeks passed, and I was cleared to leave. As I exited the hospital, permanently scarred on my arms, face and sides. 
I passed the waiting room. It had some toys lying on the ground. The game jacks, a toy fire truck, a doll, a toy car track. Sitting with these toys was a small girl with long black hair. She wore a white gown. She looked up at me and smiled widely, and in a voice that pierced every cut on my body, she said, Will you play with me? Encounters with the Rake Have you ever seen the Rake? Probably not. As legend says, once you have seen it, it will stalk you until you go insane. Or die. Whichever comes first. I've collected two terrifying stories about the Rake, just in case you're sleeping well at night and need something to keep you awake. Our first story is about a young woman called Carrie. Her parents sent her to a boarding school to bring her out of her shell. She was a shy, timid girl, and her parents felt that standing on her own two feet would build her character. She met a boy whilst there, and soon they became an item. Though forbidden, Carrie snuck out of her room at night to meet with him on a park bench at the back of the school. It was fairly dark back there, and somewhat hidden from view. If the teens were quiet, they probably wouldn't be caught. Though it was exciting for her to go out at night, kissing her boyfriend in the dark, Kerry couldn't help feeling a little terrified. If they were caught out there, the punishment would be harsh. Her fear reached a peak when they heard a snuffling noise coming towards them. It was a dog, attached to a leash, which was held in the hand of one of the strictest teachers in the school. The teens sank to the floor, hoping the teacher wouldn't spot them and the dog wouldn't out them. The dog began to bark in a frenzy. Kerry thought they were done for, risking a peek over the bench. Perhaps they could make a run for it. Kerry quickly realised the dog wasn't barking at them, but at the dark bushes to the right of the bench, where they cowered behind. The teacher regarded the dark bush thoroughly, before giving the leash a quick tug and walking the other way. Too grateful to care what the dog was barking at, Carrie stood, throwing her arms around her boyfriend as they both laughed quietly. Carrie was the one who spotted the rake as it materialised from the shadows, just beyond the faint glow of a streetlight. She made out the tall, slender figure, The long fingers, the glowing eyes, staring straight into hers. Just as she grabbed her boyfriend in terror, it melted back into the shadows. He didn't see anything, but Carrie had seen enough. She'd experienced enough scares tonight. She just wanted to go back to her room and go to bed. Later that night, Carrie awoke in the darkness of her dorm. All the girls slept in bunk beds, and Carrie slept on the bottom. Disorientated, Carrie looked around from side to side. She had the sensation that something had awoken her, but she couldn't figure out what. Raising her eyes, she spotted the girl in the top bunk of the bed beside hers. The girl stared at Carrie, her eyes wide with shock and terror. I saw it, the girl gasped. It climbed on top of you. It was suffocating you. Carrie remained awake all night. 
The next day, she was summoned to the Dean's office. Her roommate had told the Dean what happened, stating she wanted to switch rooms. The Dean asked Carrie to describe what she saw. He appeared concerned and requested her to tell him absolutely everything. She did, including what she saw when she'd snuck out the night before. The Dean was visibly shaken, though he assured Carrie she would be safe. Later that day, Carrie entered her dorm. She found two monks by her bed, performing some kind of ritual. She never saw the rake again. Carrie became convinced that the Dean had encountered the rake before, that it had tormented other students at that school. Another, even more horrifying story about the rake happened in 2006. A woman awoke in the middle of the night, intending to use the bathroom. She let out a scream when she spotted a figure crouched at the bottom of her bed. She scrambled back in terror, her limbs becoming entwined with the bed sheets. The creature crawled up on the bed towards her, then turned and stared at her husband, and all he could do was stare back, horror-stricken. It stared at him for the longest time, before turning suddenly and scuttling off out of the room. Seconds later, the couple heard their daughter screaming. They rushed to her room and found her holding herself, rocking back and forth. That was the rake. That was the rake. That was the rake. She muttered repeatedly. Obviously in shock, the husband bundled the daughter up in a blanket and put her in the car to take her to the hospital. The wife stayed behind with their son, the only one in the family who hadn't seen the rake. Sadly, they never made it to the hospital. The car sped off the road and into a lake. Both the father and daughter drowned. Convinced that the rake was responsible, the grief-stricken wife set up a tape recorder every night while she slept. Three weeks later, she caught some sounds, like the mutterings of an unknown entity whispered over her sleeping form. Two mornings later, her son found her dead on her bedroom floor. So, what is the rake? Supposedly, it's a humanoid creature that torments the living. Some suggest that though death seems to follow a sighting of the rake, the rake itself does not kill its victims. It simply torments them, fills them with terror, so that their death is usually brought about by their own actions. It's attracted by fear and negative feelings associated with anxiety and depression. Carrie, the girl from the first story, believes her fear of being caught with her boyfriend after dark is what attracted the rake to her. The first known account of an encounter with the rake was a mariner's log written in 1691. A Mariner's Log, 1691. He came to me in my sleep. From the foot of my bed, I felt a sensation. He took everything. We must return to England. We shall not return here again at the request of the rake. Another report happened in the 1800s, along with a description of hollow black eyes. 
a farewell note left behind in 1964, claimed the author had taken their own life after being tormented by the rake. Some believe the rake is nothing but a result of mass hysteria and or mental health issues. Others believe it's a demon. Whatever it is, it will remain a legend as long as people believe in it. Chains. I leaned against the wall, clutching my stomach, panting heavily and feeling numb all over. Blood was splattered all over me, and I'm pretty sure about a quarter it was my own. But I couldn't really focus on that. Right now, all I could think about was the limp figure lying on the ground in front of me, blood pooling around him. A knife lay on the ground next to his open hand, the glistening blade tinted with red, the same red on my shirt. My stomach lurched at the thought that it had come from me. Buddy, I choked, covering my mouth as tears formed in my eyes. Memories flashed by as I stared at his corpse, remembering his bright smile and deep horse-like laugh. He'd taken me in when I was a little kid, after my parents pretty much abandoned me. We lived alone in the mountains, miles away from other people with only a computer connecting us to the rest of the world. Even so, we were never lonely. We had each other, and I grew up happy and loved. He was supposed to be my guardian, my protector. And now he was dead. And he had tried to kill me. Vomit crept up the back of my throat. I didn't know whether to swallow it or just let it out. Why? Why had he tried to kill me? We'd had so much fun over the years. Not once did I ever see any signs indicating he didn't like me. There was no abuse, no disconcerting looks or terrifying nights. He loved me like his own daughter and I loved him back like a father or uncle. All I could imagine was his warm, loving smile as I stared at his face, eyes glazed open, and his expression now permanently etched with pain. At this point, I can't hold the vomit back anymore, and I hunched over and puked. I couldn't understand. That morning he'd been so normal when he left for town to go on his weekly shopping trip. He'd even choked about buying me sexy underwear, even though I have no need for it. Why had he been covered in blood when he stumbled out of his pickup truck? Why had he swung that knife at me when I brought him inside to get first aid? Why had he kept looking at the basement? The basement. My eyes started over to the door behind his corpse. My breathing still heavy. I'd been in there a few times, but not often. It wasn't that I was forbidden to go there, I just didn't want to. He'd filled it with stuff about monsters and murderers and stuff. But he was a horror fanatic. Always had been. But he never could get me into it as much as him. He spent a lot of time down there, watching horror movies and stuff like that. But now that I thought about it, he'd been going down there more and more. Was that the reason? Had he become so obsessed with the serial killers in movies that he decided to become one? The thought was ridiculous. If being a horror fan was enough to become a killer, that stuff would have been illegal by now. But the body I knew wouldn't murder someone. He just wouldn't. Not a stranger, not an intruder, and especially not me. Wiping the vomit from my mouth, I stumbled to my feet, using the wall for support. Sharp pain shot through my side where he'd stabbed me, but I didn't care. Slowly, I approached the door and grabbed the handle. Taking deep breath before I opened it and entered the dark abyss. How long had it been since he had last seen the sky? 
how long since he had last been able to roam freely? Those were the questions on Jack's mind as he sat in the corner of the room, arms suspended above his head by metal shackles, and his hands stuffed into steel mittens. It had been so long since he'd last held his scalpel, so long since he'd last been able to move freely. The human mind could only be idle for so long, and even though he wasn't human anymore, he could still feel what remained of his sanity slowly slipping away. A failed attack had led to him getting captured, but instead of being turned over to the police like he'd expected, he'd been chained up in his intended victim's basement, with no visible means of escape. The only comfort left was that his captor had allowed him to retain his mask, only removing it to feed his inhuman prisoner. The door creaked, and Jack tensed, listening as footsteps descended the stairs. The scent of blood laced the air, making his stomach growl in hunger. It had been two days since his last meal, and even then, it was meagre at best. Saliva gathered at the edge of his mouth at the thought of eating, but he didn't look up. He didn't want to look at his captor, at least not of his own volition. That man would come to him on his own anyway, and force him to look at him. He would tear off Jack's mask, despite his struggles, feeding him an organ skewered on a stick, in order to stay out of the range of his sharp teeth. That was how it always went. However, the footsteps stopped. For a long time, nothing happened. Finally, Jack slowly raised his head, peering through the black gauze, filling his mask's eye holes to look at his captor. However, instead of the tall man with the beard, he saw the unfamiliar figure of a teenage girl staring at him with wide eyes. When I went to the basement, I didn't know what I was expecting to find or even what I was looking for. As I descended the stairs, I couldn't help noticing that the lights were already on their dimmest setting, giving the room's contents an eerie glow. Horror movie posters and weapons lined the walls, with action figures, replica masks, life-size standees of horror icons, and other horror-oriented merchandise lining the floor and tables. Glancing around as my eyes adjusted to the darkness, My heart came to an abrupt stop. Leaning against a far wall was a figure clad in black, barely visible in the darkness, save for a navy blue mask and tufts of brown hair sticking out of a hood. As my eyes adjusted, I noticed its arms were suspended above its hand and shackled to the wall with metal cuffs, and the hand stuffed into some weird mittens that looked like steel balls. For a moment, I felt too numb to think. Please, please be a prop, I silently pleaded. Please don't be real. Please, please don't be a real person. As if hearing my thoughts, the mask shifted and raised, the black eyes with dripping black paint seeming to meet mine. My stomach sank upon seeing the movement, and I felt like I was about to throw up. No. No, 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 no. Buddy was keeping a person down here. He had a person chained up in the basement. How long had he been here? I was eating dinner right above here while a person was locked in the basement, sleeping in my warm cozy bed while he was forced to sit here with his hands freezing inside steel fetish mittens. That mask, it looked like something out of a horror movie. 
Had Buddy forced him to wear it this entire time? Somehow, I managed to swallow back the bile and opened my mouth, but no sound came out. I didn't know what to say, what to do. No, I did know what to do. I staggered across the room and knelt in front of him. Pain shot through my side again, but I gritted my teeth and resisted the need to cry out as I clutched the wound. Are... are you okay? I managed to ask, my speech halting and slow, as I tried to keep the pain from showing in my tone. Right now, that was the last thing he needed. After a moment, he gave a single nod, filling me with relief. Good. My name is Melissa. Here, let me help you get this off. I reached for the mask to remove it, but he recoiled and shook his head violently, catching me off guard. You... don't you want it off? There was a pause, and then he shook his head. I took that as a no. This puzzled me, but I wasn't really in the mood or mindset to ask questions. There was still too much to process. My beloved uncle figure had just tried to kill me, and now I found out he was a kidnapper? Everything felt like a horrible nightmare, but the pain in my side was a constant reminder that this was all too real. When Jack saw the unfamiliar girl, he found himself catching his breath. Even in the dim lighting, he was clearly able to see her messy hair. Her eyes were wide, and almost seemed to glow against her face. Everything about her was dishevelled and messy. But at that particular moment, she seemed to glow like an angel. After a few moments of staring, he realised the red splotches on her shirt and pants weren't part of the design, but were blood. Seeing it made his mouth water even more, hunger quickly rearing its ugly head. But he fought back his desire to attack. He wasn't exactly in the position to do so anyway. And at that moment, she was his only hope for freedom. The first ray of hope in weeks. Maybe even months. She approached and knelt before him, her face visibly distorting in pain. Up close he noticed there was a large tear in her shirt through which he could glimpse a large bleeding cut, which didn't help his hunger pangs. Was all that blood hers? He hoped not. She couldn't pass out on him now, or they'd both probably die. Obviously fighting off the pain, the girl asked about his well-being. Her voice was musical compared to that of the man's raspy voice. That man. Where was he? Was he upstairs? He'd worry about that later. For now, Jack needed to focus on escaping. He didn't dare speak. Not wanting this in human nature to slip out. It had been a while since he last spoke, and his hunger didn't make him very trusting of his ability to speak normally. For that same reason, he recoiled when she tried to remove his mask. If she saw his face, he needed her to free him first. The girl seemed a bit taken aback by it, but she accepted it without question, and began inspecting the cuffs. Do you know where he keeps the keys for these things? She asked, her voice still slow and halting. Hmm, 
that cuts in her side must really hurt. Reflexedly, he tried to move his hands to point, but obviously that wouldn't work. So instead he nodded his head towards the desk behind her, hoping she'd get the message. She turned to look and asked, Do you mean the desk? Like, one of the drawers? Relieved she'd figured it out, he nodded, and she staggered to her feet and slowly made her way towards it. Sorting through the drawers for what seemed to be forever, she finally returned with two keys. If he had eyes, they would have lit up at the sight of the small metal objects. Freedom was finally in his sight. No pun intended. Keys in hand, I reached for the padlock on the shackles and tried to open it. Panic overcame me momentarily when the key didn't fit, trying to jab the lock desperately, until finally a simple realization hit me. This lock went with the other key. Dropping the first key, I picked up the second one, and it slid in perfectly. Click. The first shackle opened, and his arm fell to his side limply soon followed by the other one. Clearly, they'd been suspended for quite some time. He didn't seem to have any strength. Almost done, I told him, giving him a shaky smile. The pain in my side seemed to be getting worse, but I needed to stay strong, or at least look like it. I couldn't show any weakness. He had enough to worry about as was. I lifted one of his hands by the wrist, my hand shaking the entire time, and used the first key to undo the padlock. Click. The ball had a hinge at the top, apparently meant to be open in a way that made it split in half, and I steadied my hands long enough to do just that. Lifting it off of his hand, suddenly my body went tense and the mitten fell from my hand, landing on the ground with a clatter. His hand was grey, a colour unnatural for humans. His fingernails, meanwhile, weren't just nails. They were more like claws, sharp enough to shred something. I stared at them with wide eyes, unsure of what to make of it. What? I sputtered. But then suddenly he lunged at me, knocking me onto my back and pinning me to the ground. His one free hand wrapped around my neck, squeezing tight. I was so shocked, I, I didn't even try to fight back. I just stared up at that navy blue mask. What the? At that moment, everything seemed to crash around me. All of the insanity of the night came to a head in my mind. I just... I just couldn't take it anymore. Eyes flattering, my vision blurred, and I blacked out. Kage Cow. Mark sighed and looked up at the night sky. He was standing on the roof of his apartment building, four stories up. Sometimes Mark just liked to stay out there and reflect. It was quiet and peaceful. Looking down you could see the normal hustle and bustle of the city life, but if you look up, you could see the beautiful sky and sometimes even a full moon or some stars. Mark walked along the border of the roof that helped keep him from falling to his death. It was pretty late, so he should go back down to his apartment soon. Then he saw something waving in the wind a few metres away. Mark walked over to it and picked it up, seeing that it was today's newspaper, and began to read the front page. Young man found dead near woods. Earlier today, John Parker, age 20, 
was found dead near the northern woods. His family stated he never had any real enemies, but he was a bit of a troublemaker. Still, they did not know who would want him dead. His death seemed to be caused by blood loss. The wounds seemed to be from large animals, but this was later found not to be the case, as a symbol was found carved into the man's forehead. The symbol was the dash. Mark put the newspaper down where he found it. He didn't want an article like that ruining his night. He walked along the border with his arm on it, looking up at the sky. Twenty years. So young. He felt sorry for the kid. He himself was nearly thirty. He thought of all the things the man would never be able to do now that his life was gone. Mark tried to get it out of his head. He didn't want to get depressed. Without knowing it, Mark's hand bumped on an empty cardboard box that was on the edge. He tried to catch it, but it was too late. It was sent falling down towards the streets. It was odd. He didn't see any cars. Only one lonely person walking along the sidewalk. Hey, watch out! He called. But it was too late. The box fell on the person's head. Well, at least it was an empty cardboard box. He was about to call down his apologies when what happened next made him freeze. The person who was on the sidewalk looked up at him. He had a black hoodie and a black and white striped scarf. That, of course, was not what made him freeze. The person also had a peculiar mask, half pitch black and half a luminous white. He managed to get back his voice, and was going to shout his apologies. Maybe this guy just came from a strange party or gathering, when he was yet again frozen by what he saw. The man said something that Mark couldn't quite hear, and then jumped onto the wall. He began climbing up the side of the building, similar to the style of a spider or lizard. Mark was just frozen. Mouth agape, trying to make sense of what he was seeing. The strange man, no, monster, reached the top of the building and crouched on the border's edge. Mark now saw how he was able to climb the building so easily. He was wearing white gloves, but there were long black, cat-like claws extending from the end of each finger through the glove. He saw that the mask had a face on it, but only half a face. On the white side of the mask, there was a shape of an angry looking eye, and a mouth curved into a frown. Then he stared at the other. It was only a few seconds, but to Mark, it felt like an eternity. Then something strange happened. The monster's mask changed. The angry mouth and eye disappeared, and on the black side of the mask appeared a happy eye and a strange smile. The monster cocked its head to one side and said, Do you want to play? Mark screamed and ran towards the little door leading to the inside of the building. He prayed that the monster wasn't following him. He reached the door and threw it open, bolted inside and slammed it shut, panting. He leaned against the door to keep it shut. After a while, he wondered if the monster was still there and why it didn't try to force the door open. He had no idea what it said to him, but there was something odd about the way it said it. It seemed happy and playful but was also angry and malicious. He gathered up his courage and decided to open the door. Putting one hand on the knob, he took a deep breath and slowly opened the door, ready for whatever was on the other side. Mark expected to find himself face to face with that odd mask. 
Instead, he saw that the monster was still where he had left him, standing on the edge of the roof and smiling that odd and somewhat malicious smile. The monster said again, Do you want to play? (laughs) I want you to play. Mark slammed the door shut again. His legs fell from beneath him, and he sat on the floor. He didn't like the way the monster said those things to him. He sat there for a while, trying to make sense of what happened. Well, it was late. Maybe he fell asleep on the roof and had a nightmare. He decided to check it one more time. Mark stood up and slowly opened the door. Part of him said that the monster would be in the same spot and say the same thing. The other part told him that the monster would be right next to the door, claws unsheathed and ready to slash. He was wrong. The monster was gone. It was nothing but the lights of the city and the sounds of a few cars driving by. He let out a sigh of relief. It was all just a dream. The door slammed shut in his face. He made a sound of pain as the metal of the door whacked him on his forehead. Mark rubbed his head and fell to the ground. What the hell was that? He shouted to no one in particular. He didn't close the door. Even if he did, he wasn't that clumsy and the wind wasn't strong enough to close it. He told himself that maybe it was just a freak gust of wind, but his mind quickly disagreed when he heard the laugh again. (laughs) The noise came from right outside the door, a little above it. The monster must have been standing on top of it. Mark woke up confused. He was in his own apartment, in his bed. He looked around to make sure it really was his own place. It was. He sighed again. It must have all been a dream. One of those odd dreams that you could have sworn it was real because it felt so real. But then you realise it was just a dream because it was so odd. Mark laughed a little to himself, as if monsters like that actually existed. A sudden pain in his forehead appeared, which made him stop. Maybe it was real, and he just didn't remember coming back down. Mark quickly dismissed the idea. Maybe he had fallen down in his sleep, and then gotten back up again. Things like that happen. Mark got up and went to his fridge to get something to drink. Grabbing a glass on his way there, he opened up a carton of orange juice to have for breakfast. He tilted the carton to pour some into the glass when the juice spilled onto the counter. He paused and stared at it, confused. Then he realised that there was a thin gash on the side of the carton so that when it was tilted, the juice didn't reach the top, but spilled out the slit instead. (laughs) There it was again. It came from inside the apartment. He turned around quickly, scanning the room for that monster. Then he stopped, realising how paranoid and foolish he was being. He had obviously imagined it the cut in the carton, his girlfriend could have done that. They had recently gotten into a fight. Mark cleaned up the mess and decided he wasn't going to have anything for breakfast. He didn't feel like eating. He was worried how he was going to make up to his girlfriend, Beatrice. He loved her and wanted to make her understand how much he loved her. He turned on the television and watched for a couple of hours, forgetting his troubles. 
It was now noon. He got up and walked into the kitchen, leaving the television on. He opened up the cabinet that he kept his alcohol in. Taking out a bottle of beer, he poured some into a glass, and then nearly dropped the bottle when he saw it wasn't beer. It was just plain water. He frowned and drank a little to check, and it was just plain water. He stared at it angrily and grabbed another bottle, then another and another. Their contents had been replaced with just normal water. He sighed angrily, and then there it was again. (laughs) Mark jumped a little. It was that laugh again. He told himself again and again that he had just imagined it. He was just getting paranoid because his dream felt so real. Beatrice could have done this too. There was no monster. He dug around the cabinet to see if there was anything left in there. In the back, he knew he had two bottles of wine and one bottle of champagne but he wanted to save those for when Beatrice forgave him. He saw the bottles and was about to close the cabinet when he did a double take. One of the bottles of wine was missing. Mark looked at where he kept the wine glasses and one of them was missing too. Beatrice could have done that too. She was pretty mad, Mark said to himself quietly. He swore to himself he would make it up to her, even if it was the last thing that he did. Then he heard it again. (laughs) It came from the living room, where he left the television on. He knew he hadn't imagined it this time. The laughter was real. He closed the cabinet shut and ran into the room. Sure enough, there was the monster. It was sitting on the couch, drinking a glass of wine, watching the television that had been left on. The monster paused and looked up at Mark, smiling. It picked up the open bottle of wine with one hand and shook it a little towards him. Why? Mark paused, staring at the monster. He quickly snapped out of it and ran back to the kitchen as quickly as he could. It was real. He really expected the monster to get up and come after him to kill him and eat him because that's what monsters do. But the monster remained in there. He could hear it laughing at him. Mark was afraid. He had to get it out of his place and out of his life. He looked around the kitchen for something to use. Panicking, he grabbed the nearest knife he could find and ran back into the living room, ready to fight. The monster was gone. There was no trace. The evidence was the missing bottle of wine and wine glass. He tensed up. Maybe he was going crazy due to that dream. No, no, no! I'm not crazy. That can't happen. It won't happen. I won't let it. He rambled to himself. He went back into the kitchen and put the knife away. He walked back into the living room and sat on the couch. Picking up the remote, he turned off the television to think. Maybe I'm hallucinating. Maybe I'm going crazy because I'm depressed because Beatrice is mad at me. The strange dream just happened to mix with it. Mark got up and grabbed his phone to call her. He dialed her number and waited for her to pick up. Mark was so excited about making up to her that he did not notice someone slip in through the window and watch him. Hi, Beatrice. It's me. I'm so sorry about the fight we had. I... No, I'm really sorry. I promise I'll make it up to you. I swear, I'll... He set the phone down. She had hung up. 
Only then did he see something in the corner of his eye, but when he turned about, it was gone. I'm going to make it up to her, he told himself, grabbing his jacket and putting it on. I'm going to apologise in person. Mark paced around the apartment, thinking of what he should give her. Then he realised and opened up the cabinet to grab a bottle of champagne. But when he opened it up, the bottle was gone. He thought to himself that his sincere apology would be enough, and went out the door to see her. Mark walked along quickly, rehearsing what he was going to say. The entire time he was walking, he always felt that someone was following him. He told himself it was just him being nervous. Mark reached her house and stood on the front steps, afraid that she wouldn't forgive him and break up with him. He reached out his fist to knock on the door, but quickly took it back. He was afraid. Mark sighed and swore under his breath, telling himself he was a coward. He turned around and walked away, not noticing that laugh that happened right behind him, followed by the sound of an opening window. (laughs) Part 2 Mark left the bar he was at. He had come to this bar to have a little bit to drink before he faced Beatrice. But he didn't feel like drinking at all, and hardly touched what he bought. Mark told himself that he would go and apologise like a man, and set off towards her house. Mark reached out his fist and knocked on the door loudly. He waited. No one answered. He pressed the doorbell several times, and could hear it ring through the house. Still, no one answered. Getting worried, he knocked on the door and shouted her name, but there was still no answer. He tried the doorknob, and it opened. That was odd. She usually kept the door locked. The first thing he noticed when he entered was the open window. The wood bordering the sides of it seemed to have a lot of claw marks on it like a cat had been there. He walked into the dining room and called out her name. He paused when he saw the bottle of champagne on the table. It was the bottle that he had had in his cabinet, and it was open. He picked it up and examined it. There was a note taped to the side of it. The note read, Beatrice, I'm so sorry about our fight. I really want to make it up to you, because I love you with all my heart and soul. Mark. Mark stared at the note, looking at the little heart following the word, soul. He didn't remember sending this to her. Beatrice, he shouted. He walked around the table and his blood ran cold. He saw her, his darling Beatrice, on the floor. She wasn't moving, and shards of broken glass surrounded her. Beatrice! Mark shouted and fell to the floor to pick her up, ignoring the cuts given to him by the shards of glass. He saw from the shapes of them that they were from a wine glass. Tears streamed down his face, and he hugged her. He knew she was dead. That's so sweet of him. Mark paused and looked up. There it was. The monster. It was sitting in the windowsill, imitating her voice. I'm so sorry we ever fought in the first place. Mark stared at it, anger boiling up inside. Then she died. (laughs) It's poison. (laughs) It laughed hard, 
putting its hand up to its face to try to stop. You think this is funny? You killed her! I'll kill you! Mark stood up and grabbed the bottle. <laughs> Mark threw the bottle, but the monster jumped out of the window before it reached it. He was going to kill it. He would make it pay. Mark walked over to Beatrice's dresser. He knew where she kept a pistol for self-defence. He pulled it out and opened the clip, seeing that there was only four bullets left. That was alright. He only wanted one. Mark ran out the door. There was no sign of the monster anywhere. He knew it was going back to his apartment though. Mark ran as fast as he could, ignoring the crosswalk signs and the other people, just running. He reached his apartment building and ran up to his floor, slamming the door open to his apartment. He was right. The monster was there. It was just lying on top of a bookshelf, holding a glass of wine. The wine bottle in the other hand. The wine is all gone. Mark flew into a rage and pointed the gun towards it, firing a bullet. It sprung up and jumped to the wall, leaving the wine glass behind and clinging to the wall with its claws so that its back was facing Mark. He shot a second time and it flipped over so that it was now facing Mark its left arm and leg bending further than a normal human's. He shot again, and it dropped to the floor, now on all fours. Mark shot yet again, and it did a roll to dodge. Then it jumped back onto the wall, staying there and staring at him. Mark walked over to it angrily, and pointed the pistol towards its forehead. He then pulled the trigger, but there was only a click. There were no more bullets. The monster began to laugh crazily. <laughs> Fail. Mark was enraged and swung the gun towards it for a melee attack. But the monster crawled to the side, picking up the wine glass that it had left on the bookshelf. It threw the wine glass at Mark, but Mark dodged it. Then it threw the wine bottle, and it hit him square between the eyes. Mark passed out. When he regained consciousness, he was face to face with the monster. It was clinging to the ceiling, its arms and legs bending back in a 90 degree angle, so it was facing him. Its mask changed again. The luminous smile on the dark black side of its mask disappeared, and the angry frown reappeared on the white side of its mask. Then it said to him in a dark voice, lacking the happy playfulness of before. You're boring. It made a low growling hissing sound and pounced. Later that day, the police arrived at Mark's apartment. A neighbour had called them because they had heard gunshots. Mark was found dead. Claw marks all over his body and throat clawed out. The kill seemed animalistic and claw marks were found all along the walls and ceiling. Bloody footprints were found headed towards the window so they determined that it was done by a human. Upon further inspection of the body, they found something carved into the skin on his forehead. Boring. Zelgo, he comes. Forgive the length of this message. This is the first and possibly last time I'll have access to a computer. So I thought I'd better write this all down while I can. 
and get this to those who should know. I'm leaving town. I don't know where I'm going. I'm just getting as far away as I can. <sighs> okay, so some of you may know, I took out a loan and opened my own auto shop a little over a year ago. Business has been going decently well. I can't complain. And I've always been grateful for all of my customers who would come to me exclusively when God knows there are so many already established places in town. I've been doing well enough that I was able to hire my buddy Neil a few months ago, and he's been working hard and helping out really well, as I always knew he would. Well, I needed to take a day off to go to a Lamaz class with Rebecca last month, so I entrusted the shop to Neil for the morning and most of the afternoon. That's the day I think everything actually started, because when I got back, he seemed to be in a stupor and was covered in oil. He even had some smeared across his face, as if he'd tried to drink it or something. I told him to go home and clean himself up, because we had no clients at the moment, and I could take care of anyone who came in for the time being. He came back 45 minutes later, but he was still much quieter than usual. He worked as well as he ever did, but something just seemed off about him. I asked him if anything happened while I was out, and he just shook his head. I asked how many clients we had, and he just muttered something unintelligible. I asked him to repeat himself, and he turned and glared at me, and for the briefest moment, I could have sworn his eyes appeared to be completely black, no iris, no sclera just utter, all-consuming blackness. I stumbled back and bumped a shelf, knocking things down. When I looked back at him, he was still looking at me, but he didn't seem to be glaring hatefully the way he had before. Just seemed kind of... out of it. Just a couple, he answered. Some woman than a tattooed, biker-type looking dude. I assumed one of them must have asked for an oil change, and that's when he spilled it. So I asked if he had any trouble, and he simply shrugged. I had looked around the garage while he was gone, and I saw no traces of oil spill. So whatever had happened, he must have gotten it all on himself and none of it anywhere else, miraculously. But he seemed reluctant to talk about it, so I didn't press the issue, and we worked on throughout the day. That day and the next were relatively normal, other than him still being awkward and quiet. I asked him if he'd like to go out, and get us lunch while I tended to the shop, and he said, sure. When he came back, I was busy doing a diagnostic for a client, so he put the food on the counter in the office to wait for me, and went ahead and ate. I finished up with that customer. We'd have to keep her car overnight to figure out just why it kept dying on her. So I asked Neil to give her a ride home, and then I went to grab my food. He'd brought me some Chinese food and a nice tea. So I opened the soy sauce packets to pour some over my food when I noticed the strangest thing. It was as if the soy sauce was a living thing somehow spreading out like dozens of squirming, inky black maggots when it fell into the fried rice and burying itself inside. I took the fork and started to scoop out the rice to look deeper inside, 
and small smoky tendrils would rise from the rice occasionally and dissipate. I was incredibly hungry at that point, but I was way too creeped out to eat that, so I chucked it and the iced tea in the garbage and decided I'd just wait till I got home that evening to eat something I'd prepared with my own hands. I'd never in my life seen anything remotely like that, and I couldn't even fathom how I would ask Neil if he'd noticed anything similar. As cold and distanced as he'd been lately, I was sure he'd look at me like I was Looney Tunes, so I just shut up about it. That Friday, we went down to the old watering hole, as we always do, to get some drinks and watch the local bands play, and Neil was just as quiet and distanced as he had been all week. He's not a bad looking fellow though, and so despite him not really going out of his way to speak to anyone, a woman went over to where he was sitting and started talking to him and they ended up leaving together that night. Monday morning, I tried breaking the ice by asking how his weekend went. He gave me a nod and muttered, All right. I asked him if he got lucky with that young woman I saw him with, and he gave me the smallest grin which was quite possibly the first grin I'd seen on his face in a week, and said, It went well. I didn't pressure him for details. I knew he'd share if he chose to, and his small grin was enough to assuage my worries and to lend me some hope that he might get back to his old self soon. The day was relatively busy until about 3pm, so I finally had a spare moment to sit in the office and listen to the radio while I waited for my next client. So there I was, leaning back in my chair, with my feet propped up on my desk, when I swivelled around and looked at my bulletin board that sits behind my head with all manner of clippings stuck to it. I had a few Sunday comic strips, such as Garfield and Kelvin and Hobbes that I'd read maybe a hundred times since I'd opened the shop here. But that day, something was different. The first panel seemed normal, but in each sequential panel, inky black tendrils crept out from the edges of the frame and from behind the characters. Blood dripped from their ears and eyes, and sometimes even their noses, and in each of the strips, one of the characters would say, He comes. I sat staring in astonishment for a moment, before I realised the tendrils were moving ever so slowly. And then, each of the characters' heads turned, oh so slowly, towards me and I threw myself back from the bulletin board, sliding over my desk and onto the floor. I ran out into the garage and yelled for Neil. I could not be the only one seeing this. To my surprise, he had gone, and so I hesitantly walked back into the office and peered inside. The comics were still corrupted, but they no longer appeared to be moving. I crept over to it and reached out to pluck one of the comics free when I noticed the inky black tendrils starting to seep across the page towards where my fingers were at least three times as fast as that moved before, and I jerked my hand away. Nothing good could possibly come from letting that blot of ink touch my skin. Of course, I ripped the entire bulletin board down, burnt it in a tin trash can out back, and never spoke of it again. That night, I went home to my wife, but she was already in bed, fast asleep. My mind was racing, 
and I couldn't even bring myself to eat dinner that night. With no one to vent my worries to, I fell into a restless sleep, and kept awaking to nightmare after nightmare, seemingly every hour of the night, until I just gave up on sleep entirely. That Friday, I went to the bar again, even though my wife couldn't drink, being pregnant and all, and Neil wasn't really any fun to hang out with anymore, and none of my other friends could seem to be reached. I just needed to get a good buzz, and I'd start feeling better, I reckoned. After downing a couple of beers, I excused myself to the restroom, when I noticed I was more inebriated than I'd estimated, so I leaned over the sink to splash some water onto my face, and that's when I heard it. Like a sheet of fabric being dragged across a floor, a voice rasped ever so quietly out of the drain. It sounded like a prolonged exhale for the longest time, until I finally recognised the words hidden amongst all those vowels. He comes. Cracks appeared in the porcelain, snaking out from the ring around the drain. At least, they looked like cracks at first, but after a few seconds I recognised them as the same tendrils of corruption I'd seen in the comics earlier that week snaking their way slowly along. I stumbled backwards out of the bathroom door and right into someone's chest. I turned around and stared up into the pitch black eyes of a six and a half foot biker with tattoos covering every piece of his exposed skin besides his hands and head. I stumbled quickly away from him and his evil piercing gaze followed me as I retreated through the bar. It felt like one of those dreams where whenever you're running for your life, it feels like you're running through quicksand. As I walked across the room, I noticed the biker wasn't the only one staring at me. It seemed every pair of eyes in the place were focused on me and more than half of those eyes appeared to be perfectly black, with no hint of iris or sclera. A few lips moved, and though I couldn't hear their voices over the sound of the jukebox, I could easily guess what they were saying. He comes. I didn't get a wink of sleep that night. I haven't been getting much sleep for the past couple of weeks, as a matter of fact. Which I'm guessing, those of you who I've spoken to recently could have guessed. I keep seeing those pitch black eyes staring at me. I'm afraid everyone I see will turn and whisper those words to me, staring deep into my soul with that evil glare. Every time I go near a sink or go to grab a bite to eat, I'm afraid to see those inky, snaking tendrils squiggling towards me. Even my wife has seemed cold and distant lately. Then tonight, as I'm driving home from work, struggling to keep my eyes open so that I don't drift off into oncoming traffic, my cell phone rang, and it was Rebecca. She was on her way to the hospital to have our baby, and for the first time in two weeks, I was actually happy. She was in the labour room, strapped to a monitor, when I got there, watching for her contractions. She barely noticed when I walked in, but didn't seem startled when I sat down beside her and took her hand in mine. I tried talking to her, but she was unresponsive, and I was so tired I didn't even realise I had started to drift off to sleep until the nurses came in and started to move her to the delivery room about half an hour later. I put on my scrubs and a hairnet and went in to her to hold her hand and coach her through like they'd trained us in Lamaze. 
when she started cursing and screaming. I was prepared for that, as well as her ever-tightening grip on my hand. But when I saw the movement in her tummy, my mind started to reel. The doctor said the baby was crowning and told her to push. I echoed his orders, and she screamed at me with a voice I couldn't begin to describe. When I looked down at her, she was staring at me with those same eyes I'd seen on the biker. The same eyes I thought I'd seen on Neil weeks before. I tried to jerk my hand away, but she maintained her grip. Black tar-like blood splashed the front of the doctor's scrubs, but he seemed to pay no heed. When I looked at her tummy again, black veins seemed to stand out beneath her skin, pulsating. She continued to stare at me, and she was no longer screaming. Just grinning, those obsidian eyes boring into me. To invoke the Nesperdian hive mind of chaos, she breathed in a raspy voice. He who waits behind the wall, the doctor continued as he stared down at the child. My child, lying silently cradled in his blood-stained hands. He looked up and raised the baby, and it appeared to be covered in oozing inky black liquid, much like that which had covered Neil a couple weeks prior. It did not cry out, but it was alive, and it moved when he held it up. When its eyes opened, they were as black as my wife's as black as the doctors. In unison, they all breathed his name. Zelgo. I ripped my hand free of my wife's iron grip and stumbled out of the room, barreling into the nurses passing in the corridor just outside. When I stood up and looked back into the room, I could see the inky black tendrils seeming to extend from the doctor and my newborn, across the floor to where I stood. I turned and ran down the hall to the elevator and slammed my finger into the buttons. When I looked back, the tendrils had come into the hallway, yet no one seemed to notice until it slithered over their feet and up their legs, at which point they abruptly stopped, turned, and looked at me with those same obsidian eyes. I abandoned my effort to call the elevator and broke into a panicked run for the stairs. I ran down the 15 flights of stairs all the way to the lobby, tore ass into the parking lot, hopped into my car and started driving. I didn't know where the hell I was going, I just had to get the hell away from there. I don't know if I'm going crazy, it certainly seems like it, but I just can't be around anyone I know anymore. They all have those same eyes, and those same dead stares. And even my child. Oh god, my baby. I still saw those eyes staring at me from the cars beside me. And by some strange coincidence, The same biker from the previous Friday night at the bar pulled up beside me an hour away from the hospital and followed me for nearly two miles. He'd turn and stare at me, grinning. I couldn't see his eyes through his sunglasses this time, but I knew it was the same guy. His tattoos seemed to move of their own free will. The flaming skull on his right bicep began bleeding from its eye sockets. As soon as I could, I slammed on my brakes, allowing him to fly past me as I swerved to my left and did a U-turn. I think I lost him. That was about an hour ago. I'm at a motel three hours out of town, the first place I found that has Wi-Fi. And I'm tired. 
and I'm shaking. And my hand itches where my wife's nails scratched me open. I honestly don't know what to do. Or who I can turn to. This story will sound insane, and I'll probably be institutionalised. And I'm not sure that wouldn't be the best thing for me. But I just can't bear to look into those eyes anymore. Every time I see someone new, and they stare at me, I start to panic because I know, I just know it's out there, looking for me. Whatever it is. And even when I lay down and start to drift off to sleep, I hear those words. He comes.